Our next speaker is Mr. Alex Stamos. He is currently an adjunct professor at Stanford's Freeman Spogli Institute, a William J. Perry Fellow at the Center for International Security and Cooperation, and a visiting scholar at the Hoover Institution. He was previously the chief security officer at Facebook, during which he led the company's investigation into the manipulation of the 2016 U.S. election. Additionally, he's also worked as the chief information security officer at Yahoo. Please welcome Mr. Alex Stamos. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. How are you doing? Good. Um, apologize for the coffee. I'm still on West Coast time, even after two or three days. Um, so what I wanted to talk to you folks about today a little bit is the struggle to define who is responsible for different parts of protecting uh, what we, we like to colloquially call cyberspace, um, how those lines are being drawn, what the responsibilities are, and how some of these decisions are being made, and, and some of the things we need to think of collectively over the next couple of years as we go deeper and deeper into uh, making these decisions and, and, and the impact they're gonna have on our lives. But first I wanna take you back a little bit to some of kind of the founding ethos of Silicon Valley so you can get a feel for, for how we got into this place. And so uh, this is a, a quote uh, from a man named John Perry Barlow uh, who actually just passed away this year and I'm not trying to beat up on him. He was a, a, a pretty incredible man. He, he grew up on a cattle farm in Wyoming. Um, he was the lyricist for the Grateful Dead. Uh, so he traveled around with the dead writing their songs. Uh, for all the young folks, that was a band um, uh, that was quite famous, uh, both for their, their music and their, their drug consumption. Um, and then Barlow, in his retirement years, using that Grateful Dead money, founded the Electronic Frontier Foundation, one of the, uh, the critical kind of civil rights organizations that fight uh, around civil rights online. He wrote this piece, the Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace, in 1996. And this was a, specifically a response to the passing of the Communications Decency Act, which was uh, a... Clinton-era Republican Congress passed law responding to a bit of a moral panic around the use of the internet to do bad things in, in mostly about pornography online. Now, most of the Communications Decency Act, although it was passed, was thrown away by Congress. Um, one tiny little bit survived. And it's actually that bit which gives uh, which creates what's called an intermediate liability shield that gives internet companies the ability to host content that is created by other people. That part survived, but all of those controls uh, around uh, indecent material and such uh, have, have clearly, for anybody who's used the internet, have cl clearly been struck down by the Supreme Court. But he wrote this when the CDA looked like it was going to hold, and the, the U.S. government was going to heavily regulate the content that one could see online. Um, and in this screed, he pretty clearly talks about the idea of cyberspace as a new world that is disconnected from the physical world, right? That we're going to create a new world of the mind that is not corrupted like the physical world, is not under the control of governments like that. And this is kind of a very common kind of theme that runs through a lot of people in the Valley, is the idea that cyberspace is something new and pure that, 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 that can stand astride and stand apart from all of the, the messiness of the real world. And that is something that has been falling away pretty quickly and pretty aggressively for, for many years. Um, one of the real turning points in the thought process of a lot of people on this was the Arab Spring in, in, in 2011, um, where this was actually both a, a, a double-edged sword. This was a demonstration of the positive, liberating force of technology. The fact that people in the Arab world had the ability to organize online, to have free speech for the first time in their history, to communicate with each other about their democratic aspirations, that was a, a huge deal, and that's what triggered the, the Arab Spring. And this was kind of a real golden age in Silicon Valley of people feeling really good about if you give people voice, that is going to have positive impact. Now, all of us know so this did not end with the, the Arab world becoming uh, full of liberal democracies, uh, respectful of human rights, um, and, and deciding only to elect people uh, with, with respect for written constitutions. Um, it ended with the empire striking back. Uh, and this is Tahrir Square five years later, the fifth anniversary. You know, obviously, uh, the, the Egyptian government was overthrown in 2011. There was a series of governments. And the current Egyptian government is now, just like most of the governments in uh, the Arab world, has gone through this Darwinian process by which if you are now an Arab government and you're able to maintain control, it is because you understand how to utilize the internet as a tool 
for control. So that, that is the actual outcome of the Arab Spring, is it got rid of the not great dictators and brought in a new generation of much more digitally connected and uh, thoughtful dictators who really know how to reach out and send the secret police to your house using new technology. Um, and, and this is, I think, one of the things that, you know, in, in the Valley, a lot of people were thinking, man, this is, Arab Spring is great. We're, we're, we're really connecting people and making things good. And it's, it's really quickly dawned on people afterwards that connecting folks up, that the, the, the ability to turn that capability around on people is, is, is quite clear. Um, the, the other, obviously, situation that has made this clear was the interference in the 2016 election and the fact that the internet overall has become one of the primary places where great power politics is being played out. Now, I don't have to explain to this group why cyberspace is of interest to great powers to try to influence one another. Um, but just to quickly review, there are a couple of reasons here. One, uh, attacks on cyberspace allow you to have a lot more uh, subtlety, and it gives you a lot more options for things you want to do than, say, the, the application of traditional military force, right? Instead of just being able to destroy and disrupt, you have the ability to steal, you have the ability to subtly manipulate. And we have built a world where effectively the norms around what is considered an act of war that would we would respond with, with uh, kinetic military force is set incredibly high. So things that, honestly, if you, had, if you went back 30 years and you explained to people, this is what we let Russia or China or uh, Iranian Revolutionary Guard do on a, on a Tuesday, and we do not consider that an act of war, they would be shocked. But we have slowly, the, the, we, we are the, the frog in the boiling water, and we have slowly gotten ourselves into this place where a number of horrible things can happen with almost no consequence. And this has been a very effective way of asymmetrically neutralizing our much greater military power, because apparently we're not going to use that military and economic power to, to punish our foes. Um, and so a lot of people talk to us in the Valley and just say, well, great, well, we should just fix the tech. Um, and there are a lot of things that can be fixed, right? There's a lot of things we can do better in the technology we build to make it safe and trustworthy in uh, internet services to make sure they can't be manipulated. But it turns out to not just be a simple decide to fix it or not. This turns out to be a really complicated issue. Um, and uh, you know, one of the, the metaphors that anybody here who comes from engineering, by the way, who here has studied as an engineer? I'm guessing most of the West Point folks. Yeah, um, yeah. So if, in, you know, there's this old saying in engineering, you can have something done fast, cheap, or correctly, pick two of three, right? The, 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 the original engineering optimization problem, probably told by a Greek stonemason to somebody who wanted a temple built really quickly, right? Um, uh, this is you know, a classic optimization problem in that in theory, you know, obviously things are not actually like totally like this in the real world, but it is a, a reasonable approximation, um, except uh, to, apologies to the last speaker, apparently in defense contracting, you can't have any of those done uh, uh, at the same time. Um, but like for the rest of engineering, uh, that is uh, not uh, based upon that, you can generally pick a point within the triangle um, uh, to, to optimize for. Uh, but the optimization problem around the misuse of the technology to cause harm turns out to be much, much more complicated. Um, and there's a bunch of different equities that you might want to have, that you might want to shoot for. And these are all legitimate equities. And they're all equities that are represented by different groups, different NGOs in some cases, in some cases private companies, in some cases they're equities represented by nation states. Uh, so for example, you it is totally reasonable to want a uh, information system where people can communicate uh, anonymously with and, and in a way that is resistant to surveillance. But that has, it turns out, really difficult trade-offs around abuse and information integrity. If you don't know who is using an information system, the ability to investigate and to stop bad actors becomes very, very difficult, right? Um, and this is not like the triangle where you pick a point within it. This is actually something that it would be pretty much impossible to represent even with a 3D graph because the 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 trade-offs between all these different equities turns out to be incredibly complicated uh, and non-linear. So when you move towards one of these points, sometimes you have a non-linear effect where other equities fall away extremely, extremely quickly. And this is the problem that we are dealing with right now in the Valley is that 
everybody wants all of these equities all at the same time. Um, and, and from a tech industry perspective, we're not really set up well to be making these decisions. Um, and unfortunately, from my perspective, I think a lot of these decisions are being made quietly in the tech world um, in a way that is not democratically accountable uh, and, and that is not being honest with people that there are going to be serious trade-offs between them. And I'm going to talk about just a, a, a couple of those trade-offs. So um, the first is the, the privacy safety trade-off. Uh, and another kind of seminal set of events in Silicon Valley was the rise of the use of uh, tech platforms for ISIS. Now, ISIS had a couple of reasons why they would want to use global communication platforms. They would use them to recruit new recruits, right? So ISIS recruiters we would find would go search for young uh, men with Muslim names who lived in the West, who made comments about Israel or liked certain stories that had a kind of uh, Islamist uh, bent, and then they would reach out to them, slowly build a relationship, and then groom them into possibly traveling to Syria or becoming a fighter within the West. So you have the recruiting issue, you have the propaganda issue. As you all know, ISIS is pretty amazing in its use of really kind of modern marketing techniques and their ability to put out uh, super clean and modern looking propaganda, videos, magazines, stuff like that. Much of that was actually created in the West by what we generally refer to as jihadists, which are you know, Western educated people who are interested in the ISIS mission, but are not willing to actually put their lives at, at stake, but they're willing to be propaganda multipliers. Um, and uh, you know, that, that kind of stuff is actually a, a really problematic. There's another set of uh, issues, which is uh, ISIS tried to create the uh, impression that, that they had a, a significant hacking capability, a cyber offensive capability that they really didn't have. Um, and most of this came down to the capabilities of one young man, Jamaid uh, Hussein, uh, who was a, a UK citizen who moved to Syria um, and uh, uh, thanks to uh, a drone strike, uh, is no longer with us. Um, but uh, Jumaid uh, was successful in taking over the accounts of a number of different Western social media accounts and then using those accounts to imply kind of a, the, the creation of this incredible cyber caliphate of this capability in the back end. Um, by the way, also, there's a bunch of people that say they're ISIS, and it's really Russian intel. Uh, so you just got to be real careful uh, in, in the Middle East, especially about people claiming to be of a certain group uh, and then actually that being a, a false flag operation. So this was a, a legitimate set of problems. And actually, when I joined Facebook in 2015, this is one of the, the biggest sets of problems from a content moderation perspective of how do you decide what is um, uh, the celebration of, of, of terrorism uh, versus what is reporting on terrorism. Uh, and there's a lot of people that come up with really kind of easy solutions, like we'll just do image recognition for the ISIS flag. Well, we have that, right? But the problem is, is that every BBC story, every CNN story about some ISIS victory has a picture of a guy in a white pickup truck, which, by the way, I don't know, somebody here must know, how do they keep those pickup trucks so clean um, in the desert? It's pretty, pretty amazing. Like, my car is way dirtier. I would never buy a white car, um, and apparently, ISIS has like a, that's like another incredible like capability of theirs is to keep all the pickup trucks clean at all times in the middle of the Syrian desert. But there would always be a picture of a guy in a white pickup truck with a huge ISIS flag behind him. So you can't just decide um, we're going to image recognize for things like that. You couldn't even decide we're not going to ever allow any frames from a beheading video, right? The, the ISIS wants people to spread beheading videos. They want, they want the impact of that, but there is a legitimate need for Western media to report on the atrocities of this group. Um, and so this was a very difficult trade-off. But there's another difficult trade-off, which is how much data do you have that you're gonna turn around and use to find these people. And um, I actually had an interesting situation here where during the, the, the height of this issue, and, and this was a, especially an issue in Europe, right? Because Europe has this kind of restive domestic population that was open to this kind of recruiting. And after the Paris attacks, you know, there was a huge focus on our, our, our young people being radicalized online. And we had a, a set of meetings in a, a European capital where one day I met with the interior ministry, which generally in Europe oversees uh, domestic law enforcement forces. And they thanked us profusely for our help in catching a terrorist. We had helped them find somebody who had been radicalized, gave them the information. Their SWAT team blew in the guy's door um, and he admitted everything. They were super happy. Thank you for your help in catching this terrorist. Um, what can we do more together? 
And I'm like, well, let's talk about that. And then the next day, I got to sit with the privacy regulator from the same country uh, about a kilometer away, and then they told me that the data that was used to catch that terrorist, the, the existence of that data, was a, f a f violation of the fundamental human rights of their citizens, right? And that is the, the constant issue we are now running into, is that there is a, nobody is really understanding that there is a significant trade-off between data privacy and the ability to enforce not just content moderation rules, but laws, and to uh, make, and to dragoon the platforms especially as uh, participants uh, in cyber warfare against these different groups. Uh, and the place where that is most, becoming most obvious in Europe is around GDPR, which is the General Data Privacy Regulation. So uh, anybody who gets on stage and tells you this is exactly what GDPR does, um, is lying to you or they're fooling themselves because nobody actually knows what GDPR does yet. Uh, GDPR is a kind of a, a loose set of guidelines. It is a, a, a an of, officially, you know, the official text, if you read it, is very loose in telling people these are the kinds of, of rules we want to have in Europe. But the actual practical impact of those rules uh, is, is being interpreted and built out by 28 different data protection authorities. And even that has an asterisk. It turns out Germany has 13 different state level data protection authorities. So the city of Hamburg, uh, which roughly has the same population as the county I live in, in, in California, has its own data protection authority, which is pretty impressive. Like, we can't even get people to run for city county or for like sheriff, uh, and they're able to stock up uh, this huge bureaucracy uh, to regulate tech. But um, anyway, those different groups are the ones who actually have to interpret. So so nobody really knows what GDPR means yet because we're waiting for years and years of interpretation by the DPAs, lawsuits by them in their domestic uh, areas, and then, like, as always, the lawyers are the ones who, get, who win, right? This is going to be hundreds of thousands of billion hours by European privacy lawyers over the next five years as this whole mess gets worked out and then eventually makes it up to places like Luxembourg where there will be court decisions that try to standardize across Europe. But there are, so like we don't know exactly what the impact of GDPR is, but there are some areas that are clearly worrying. And, and one of the things that's pretty clear if you look at GDPR is unlike people that think adversarially in the building of systems, the architects of GDPR did not think adversarially in the building of this law. They did not think how can this law be used by people to cause harm. Um, and that makes sense because there's this crazy problem in Europe, which is that the supranational European Commission and European Parliament are not responsible for national security or law enforcement. This is a fundamental, they don't really have a constitution, but a treaty-based rule that is supposed to retain sovereignty in the individual states. That there's no EU army, there's no uh, EU law enforcement, they don't have a, a pan-EU uh, FBI. There's things like Europol, but those are just coordinating organizations, right? They don't have a standing set of people that are supposed to represent national security needs in the European Union level. And so as a result, these laws do not take into account the national security uh, and law enforcement equities. Um, and so uh, of, of all of the different parts of it, the one that is most interesting is Article 17. Uh, which is the encodification of this thing called the right to be forgotten, which has a bunch of impacts on like Google search results and stuff like that. But one of the interesting, it looks like, interpretations of this is that anybody uh, who's a European data subject, uh, which is really anybody who has the ability to bounce off of a VPN in Europe, right? So you don't actually have to really be a European. You just have to look like you're European, that you're going to have the ability to request for any tech company to delete all your data in one of the interpretations is within 10 days. And that's all of your data, including within backups and archives. So one, there's this huge kind of technical challenge of how do you do that. And there's some interesting solutions around encrypting and throwing away encryption keys and stuff like that. But the practical adversarial impact of things like you know, a terrorism recruiting online, and especially from organized groups like, like Russian intelligence agents, is if you are a organized actor, you, you can now have a, a shoot and scoot kind of model where you create fake personas online, you do what you want to do. That might be terrorist recruiting, that might be pushing propaganda, that might be interfering with somebody's election. Um, and you do that for a couple of days, you send a data deletion request and you move on. And you can create a situation where, because of GDPR, it's almost impossible to investigate. There's actually supposed to be a uh, 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 e-evidence law that was passed as well in Europe that would give the police in Europe the ability to request for data to be retained. GDPR passed, the evidence law did not. So we're in this weird place where, where all the laws are enabling um, the, the deletion of data. And this is actually kind of great for the tech companies because it makes a situation where they can wipe their hands of it, honestly. Um, and I think that's possibly what's going to happen. And this is going to be tested in the European parliamentary elections this upcoming spring. 
where there will be elections across Europe for people to represent their countries in the European Parliament. Um, there are now elections in at least three countries where there's been kind of a, a right-wing takeover by parties that have some kind of link or support from the Russian government. That's Poland, Hungary, and Italy. And so in those countries, this is going to be a fascinating play of whether or not organized actors like the private organizations like the Internet Research Agency or folks like GRU and SVR are able to utilize these things to go interfere in those elections and then make it pretty much impossible to do any investigation. Certainly, if this existed in the United States in 2016, you would know nothing of the Russian interference on Facebook because we never would have found it, right? Because we never would have been able to investigate without the data that we had to troll through tens of petabytes of data to go find that kind of interference. Um, so that's like one of those hard trade-offs. And I think uh, in the United States, one of the things we can do better is be a little more thoughtful about what kinds of data we want people to have and not have um, and how our regulation works. And I think here in the US, one of the things we could probably do, because it, it looks likely that in 2019 there's going to be some kind of privacy regulation, is we can base it around cutting data up in a couple of chunks. Um, and the first chunk is the things that are absolutely necessary to make an online service work. So for example, I use Google Photos. I create these photo albums. I share them with my family members. Kind of by definition, Google Photos has to have my photos, right? They have all the metadata that's embedded in the photos. They have a little bit of metadata about who I was when I, I uploaded them. So they might have like temporarily GPS coordinates and stuff. But no matter what, I see that here they have all of my photos for the last five years. That means that those photos are at Google and they have access to it. And so we have to first be careful to make sure that things that are absolutely necessary and where that is obvious to the user, that that has different regulations in other classes. Um, the class of data where I think there's a lot of area for improvement and where GDPR I think actually does have some positive impact is the data that is uh, collected appropriately at the time, but is over-retained. Um, this is also where a lot of the discussion is going to have to be of the safety security issues. And perhaps that we need the ability to bifurcate this data into data that can be used for things like ad targeting and other things that people see as not that important, and data that can be used for safety and security and investigative purposes. Um, and that we can have that ability. GDPR does not make that distinction of keeping data for those different purposes. Uh, but I think that, that that is a possibility in the United States. Um, so for example, it's totally reasonable when I go to Google Photos. At that moment, Google, by definition, knows my IP address. They don't have to keep that forever, necessarily, but they should ha keep it for a reasonable amount of time so that if it turns out, for example, that my account was taken over, they get an indication, like I report somebody's taken over my Google account, um, or they get some kind of indication of something bad happening, they have the ability to reconstruct who accessed my account during that period of time. And that's the kind of stuff that you need those IP addresses for. And so we got to think about, for that kind of data, is there a way to tuck it away um, in a place where uh, it can be used only for safety and security purposes and not for the kind of purposes people often talk about around privacy. Um, and then the place where a lot of Silicon Valley gets in trouble is the unnecessarily collected data. And there's actually a lot of this. And most of it's not malicious. Most of it is just through ignorance. And I think actually the big bomb that's waiting for all of us here is uh, every one of those mobile apps you download, a huge percentage of those mobile apps that you have on your phone have some kind of library that was created by a third party, right? So the manufacturer of that application went and had some kind of functionality they, they, didn't, they couldn't build themselves or they didn't want to build themselves, so they got a library from a third party. Those libraries do all kinds of creepy stuff, right? And a number of them are free, and you, you know, there's no, no such thing as a free lunch, right? As, uh, as Robert Heinlein said, uh, and... Um, uh, it's really important to, for people to understand that, and I think actually there's a lot of unnecessary data collection going on. Anybody ever wonder why there's 100 free flashlight apps in the store? It, how do you think that's being monetized, right? It's being monetized through ad networks and data collection networks that are, are pinning them a, a couple of cents on the back end every time somebody uses it. Um, that is, is resulting in a huge amount of unnecessary data collection. Um, the other, another interesting, difficult privacy trade-off I'm sorry, uh, kind of societal trade-off, is the trade-off between anonymity and data integrity. So uh, every online service has some level of anonymity that they grant their users, right? And there's, a, there's actually a wide range here. Um, on one side of the most anonymous, you have sites like 4chan and 8chan, uh, which are actually horrible, horrible uh, dens of scum and villainy 
uh, that represent the worst of humanity, and they are intentionally anonymous. Those were those were created. In fact, 8chan was created because 4chan was too uh, was too center. Uh, like 8chan's for the people that got kicked off 4chan, um, which I can't recommend ever visiting. Um, certainly don't visit from a school computer, uh, young folks. Uh, it might get you in trouble. Um, but like these are horrible, horrible sites, and they are built around anonymity, and the anonymity really feeds really horrible interactions and behavior on these sites. Um, on the far right, actually, is probably the, in the in the West, the social network with the most aggressive enforcement of name, of, of identity is probably Facebook. But that enforcement is on the individual account level. There are parts of Facebook that give you some level of anonymity, including this part, which is the idea of pages, right? So, you know, West Point has a Facebook page. That Facebook page is probably run by five or six people in the marketing department. But you can't see who those five or six people are, right? You see just the West Point page. Um, it might have a blue check mark because it's been verified as this really belongs to West Point. Um, and, uh, um, and that's, you know, you can't, when you see that, you see stuff posted as the page. You don't see it posted as the individuals. And so that is the exact kind of pseudo-anonymity that was abused by what we call the Internet Research Agency, which is actually a collection of multiple shell, private shell organizations, uh, mostly based in St. Petersburg, that do online trolling on behalf of an oligarch who's close to Putin and with a kind of uh, very complicated relationship to, to the actual Russian government. But the, we'll call them the IRA for today. Uh, uh, apologies to people who actually remember the other IRA, uh, unlike these folks. Uh, but it's just this is how how, how it's going to have to work out. Um, they abuse that kind of pseudo anonymity by creating these identities, these personas online that looked like they belonged to different subgroups of American culture, right? Um, and they would do so explicitly with the goal of, of churning up dissent uh, and in a bipartisan fashion. So for example, they would create a Black Lives Matter group in Baltimore, and they'd create a pro-police group in Baltimore, and they would have those two groups reference each other, and in some cases even try to create violence by saying, we're having a pro-police rally, we're having an anti-police rally, let's, to these different groups, let's, let's meet at the same place at the same time, right? Um, and, and they would try to drive those divisions in American society, and they were able to do so because of the pseudo-anonymity. So the, the response to this from a number of politicians has been, well, get rid of that pseudo-anonymity. Everybody has to have like a government-sponsored ID to do this. Now, one, that's antithetical to American values in a lot of ways, but you also have to think about making these equity choices on a global scale. Um, and one of the things we always dealt with at Facebook is that 90% of Facebook's users are actually not American, right? That's a, that's a key thing to keep in mind. And, and well over, from my back of the envelope, well over half of Facebook's users either live in non-free countries or they live in emerging democracies without a lot of protection of freedom of speech. What do you guys think is the country that asks for more tr content to be taken down off of Facebook than any other country? Russia, China, okay, there's some classics. Facebook's blocked in China, so it's not so interesting for them. Now, while Facebook is blocked in China, there's over 10 million users every day that use uh, the, the, the Mandarin character set that come in from VPNs uh, and from Tor. Uh, so it's not totally blocked, but it's as blocked as they can do. It's India. India is the number one country for requesting generally for all the tech companies for content to be taken down. They are legitimately a democracy. They're the world's largest democracy, but they don't have the kind of constitutional uh, freedom of speech guarantees that we have. And so lots and lots of things are illegal to say online in India. It's illegal to blasphemy. It's apparently illegal to insult the, the cousin of the police chief. Um, and the way their legal system works uh, is that the number of people that can issue those requests are actually much, much broader and do not have the same controls we have in the United States, like having to have an uh, an Article Three judge sign off on things, um, uh, and so that level of anonymity is, is really difficult for people. So, for example, anybody can anybody recognize who this man is in this wonderful crop top, uh, in those fantastically fitting jeans? King of Thailand, very good. Wow. Uh, can I give extra credit? Are there any instructors here for this young man? Um, uh, that is the king of Thailand there in the left. So the, the old deceased king of Thailand was a, a stately figure who was incredibly well respected by his people um, and who represented the Thai people uh, through some very difficult times. Um, his son uh, is a bit of a screw up uh, and uh, has never been um, considered to be really living up to the, the history of the Thai monarchy. Um, this is actually him. That is not, you'll be surprised to hear, the Queen of Thailand uh, standing next to him. Um, this is him being saluted as he boards a, a royal flight uh, after a night of partying. Um, 
Uh, he's carrying a dog, which actually technically the dog is the air marshal of Thailand. Uh, so there's another picture of uh, 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 Air Force officers having to salute the dog. Um, so there's a little bit of a Caligula kind of feel to a lot of this stuff. Um, the king of Thailand is effectively a prisoner slash tool of the military junta of Thailand, right? Um, and so uh, the people who are the ruling uh, group of, of, of military officers who are controlling Thailand use him as a tool and as a symbol. Um, and uh, there are a history of laws in Thailand called Les Majes laws, which are laws that say you cannot insult the king, you cannot insult the monarchy. Uh, and those laws are used in Thailand to suppress any speech that is pro-democracy. Because clearly, if you want to have a say in your government, you are insulting the king, a man who stands above all kinds of insults uh, uh, and, and respite, like the man is, is, is clearly perfect. Um, and so this photo, showing this photo in Thailand is actually an arrestable offense. People were arrested in Thailand for posting this photo on Facebook. That's not because Facebook told the Thai government, it's because they just went and they looked and they figured out through a number of means who these people were. But there's a lot of people who have posted this photo who have not been arrested in Thailand. And they haven't been arrested because Facebook provides that anonymity of those pages versus those accounts. They are operating on Facebook under their real names, under accounts, but they can create these pseudo-anonymous identities that allow them to talk freely. Now, they're not, those groups are not really about insulting the king. They're really about calling for a true democracy in Thailand um, and for, for free and fair elections. Uh, but like any, either one of those calls is seen as illegal. Uh, and this is the kind of thing we've got to think about when we think about the anonymity trade-off is globally what standard are we setting? One, it's just very hard for these companies to operate in totally different ways in different countries. But we also have to be really careful about putting the democratic imprimatur on any kind of control of speech. Um, and a place where this has been very obvious is Germany, where Germany, because of their, their horrible history, they have very tight controls around hate speech, around anything that's seen as pro-Nazi. I think all you know that. They passed a law called the Netz DG law, which actually stands for this humongous German word, but fortunately it can be shortened and that's DG, um, which puts the responsibility for controlling hate speech online on the platforms. And so there, there's an interesting different legal discussion about who should decide what speech is okay. In this case, NetsDG puts all of the onerous on uh, all the onus on the private companies, and there are fines for not taking down hate speech, but you never get fined for taking down too much hate speech, right? So if you put all of the incentive structure on one side, obviously you're gonna have people be way too aggressive about uh, controlling speech, but th that's a different issue. The interesting thing about NSCG is it was passed by the Bundestag. You cannot argue that the German Bundestag does not have democratic legitimacy. That is a free and fair elections. They democratically, there was real popular support for control of hate speech online. Germany is a special place. But almost immediately after that law was passed, similar laws with the exact same language translated into the local language were being considered in places like Turkey and Russia and Vietnam and Singapore, right? So we have to be really careful in the West of the decisions we make about controlling speech because it puts, what the, the Germans did was they put a democratic imprimatur on the, the German Republic, which is one of the world's most respected democracies, thinks that this is an appropriate level of speech control. And then you just define what is fake news and hate speech a little bit differently in these countries, such as clearly it is fake news if you're against, if you believe that there needs to be more than one political party in Singapore, right? Nobody would clearly believe that, right? Clearly it's hate speech in Russia if you speak out against Russia first. Um, and so, uh, I'm sorry, uh, and so um, this is a, a significant problem and it's a trade-off that I think non left people are thinking about. So what are some things we can do to do a better job of making these decisions? So in academia, one of the things we gotta do is we gotta do a better job of educating individuals about what their responsibilities are when they build technology and how to think about these kinds of things. Um, the truth is, is you can graduate from any top computer science school and you will never learn about abuses of technology outside of the very specific uh, world of um, information security, right, of, of high-end vulnerabilities and, and data breaches and such. You don't learn about bullying and harassment. You don't learn about hate speech. You don't learn about child sexual abuse, which is actually the abuse of children online is probably the worst thing that happens any day online. We talk about all these other things uh, that are really interesting and sexy, and we've kind of, as a society, accepted the idea that there can be a horrible carnage 
uh, around the abuse of children online and just kind of move past it, uh, which is a pretty horrible thing and something that we're going to try to work on at Stanford. Um, so one of the things we're doing at Stanford is we're trying to build into the educational system, one, bringing different people into, into cybersecurity. So cybersecurity is no longer just a technical discipline. It's a discipline that requires lawyers. It requires operations specialists. It requires social scientists. It requires political scientists. Um, and so like right now, I'm teaching a 100 100 person class of hacking for non-CS majors, and we're looking for other ways to do that kind of stuff. Um, something uh, else that we need society-wise is that there's been a real problem with the tech companies kind of resisting regulation, reasonable regulation, and not being part of these discussions. Um, and I think that's actually a real problem, that like, if you, if you hold up against uh, democratically passed regulation, uh, eventually the dam gets higher and higher, and eventually the dam breaks, you have a much bigger flood. Um, and th this is a, a significant problem in the Valley, and I think something that's finally going to change in 2019, having split uh, uh, parties in Congress might actually help something like this passing because there's a lot of fear on one side or the other of what internet regulation looks like. And so we could possibly see some kind of kernel of reasonable bipartisan regulation make, make it through Congress this year. Um, uh, and so uh, I do think the tech companies need to think about that. They, they also need to think about being much more open and transparent about the decisions they make. Uh, tech companies act in a quasi-governmental manner, but the what responsibilities the companies have and how they interface with actual democratically elected governments is something that has never been really thought of uh, in a thoughtful way. It is a line that changes continuously based upon who the speaker is and what the current events are. And we need to have a much better thought process around what are the responsibilities that we're gonna put on these massive, non-democratically accountable, sometimes trillion dollar organizations and what are things that are gonna be reserved for democracies? Um, and what are some things that just have not happened? Um, one of our real problems in the United States is we have hyper-competent offensive security units, uh, including folks who are represented here, we do not have a competent defensive cybersecurity agency in the United States. We don't. That doesn't mean I don't like these people. There's a lot of good people, but there's not an organization that has both the skill set and the capabilities um, to do the work that we need to do, and, and we need to look to our friends in Germany, in France, and some other democracies to think about the ways that we can lay out cybersecurity defensive responsibility in the United States in a better way. Cool, so I'm, I'm, I'm running out of time. I apologize, but if you have any more questions, uh, feel free to hit me up here. It was a pleasure to, to speak to you folks today. Thank you.